Fish. There we go. All right, it's one, it's two minutes after one and we are live. This is the uh, continuing public hearing of the Environment and Transportation Committee. I'm your friendly chairman, Kumar Barve. I'm joined by the equally friendly Vice Chairman Dana Stein and the merry band of delegates on our committee. We have many interesting bills today. So we're gonna do these in numerical order. So let me just pull that up and tell you what that order is. It's going to be, yeah, uh, the first bill is gonna be House Bill 53, Delegate Robin Lewis. Second will be House Bill 231, the Montgomery County Delegation. The third bill is uh, House Bill 368, Delegate Corman, followed by House Bill 404, Delegate Lehman, followed by House Bill 434, Delegate Wells, uh, the sixth bill will be House Bill 469, Delegates Carr and Lehman. And the final bill of the afternoon will be House Bill 487, Delegates Foley and Fraser Hidalgo. So let us see if Robin Lewis is in the house. Robin? I, I, unfortunately, they have not joined yet. Oh, she was like this when she was on the committee. No, I'm, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> Okay, we'll skip over her and go straight to the Montgomery County House Delegation 231, delegate, uh, the, the Montgomery County Automated Traffic Enforcement uh, Bill. Is somebody here from the Montgomery Delegation? I am. Who is that? Delegate Crutchfield. Oh, there you go, Delegate Crutchfield. Okay, terrific. Uh, uh, please, uh, you've got four minutes. The timer will go two and two. Please be begin and welcome to the committee. Well, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair and Committee. Um, for the record, my name is Delegate Charlotte Crutchfield, and I am from District 19 in Montgomery County, and I have the pleasure of providing testimony on HB 231, which is the Montgomery County Automated Traffic Enforcement Implementing Agency Bill. The same legislation was before you last session and was voted out by your committee. This bill simply gives the Montgomery County Council authority to transfer the Montgomery County Automated Trans Traffic Enforcement Unit, which administers a speed, red light, and school bus cameras from the County Police Department to the County's Department of Transportation. Presently, Montgomery County is engaged in a vision plan, uh, I'm sorry, engaged in a plan known as Vision Zero, with the goal to make our streets safer to all community members and specifically end all traffic fatalities and severe injuries by 2030. In addition to its current responsibility of roadway design, the Montgomery County Department of Transportation is one of the lead agencies and responsible for 31 action items under the county's Vision Zero plan. Therefore, MCDOT would be the perfect agency to consolidate automatic traffic enforcement as it has vision zero and roadway design responsibilities with a focus on public safety and transportation. I urge a favorable report from the committee because this legislation will increase public safety and continue to foster a more equitable framework for traffic enforcement by limiting the types of traffic stops that MCPD may con conduct, reducing citizen contact and the possible escalated interactions of those contacts with MCPD, increasing organizational efficiency by housing this responsibility for the Automated Traffic Enforcement Unit with MCDOT, which has a focused mission on reducing accidents and fatalities through Vision Zero. It allows MCPD to focus on other more pressing duties outside of minor traffic stops and removes the human bias at the time a violation takes place. Both the Montgomery County Council and County Executive support this bill. And I'd like to pass it on to the panelists who will give further remarks on the bill. Um, delegate, you how many people do you have signed up? Okay, go ahead. Peter Gray is next. Uh, good hey, welcome afternoon. to the committee and you have two minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my name's Peter Gray. I represent the Washington Area Bicyclist Association and it's 2,000 uh, members and thousands of other supporters who live in the great state of Maryland. We urge you to support HB 231, which as Delgate Crutchfeld uh, so uh, well put it to authorize the Montgomery County to move oversight of automated traffic enforcement from the police department to the Department of Transportation. 
Automated traffic enforcement is already a great tool to objectively enforce traffic laws without biases and allows MCDOT to implement speed and traffic monitoring systems, allowing MCDOT to implement speed and traffic monitoring systems can further move traffic enforcement into civilian hands. Moreover, as such enforcement actions are a significant tool in achieving vision zero that the county is uh, has set as a goal. It is far more efficient to have this enforcement managed by the same agency, MCDOT, that is charged. You know, I think I think you may have. Uh, I think you've. Uh, what's going on with the timer, Ben? Is hold on. Okay, go, Peter. It, please continue. Sure. Um, it's far more efficient to have this enforcement managed by the same agency, MCDOT that is charged with implementing the county's Vision Zero program. In addition, according to data that the county's Office of Oversight- It, it froze uh, uh, it. it, it might have <laughs> that the county's uh, Office of Oversight reports and an analysis of county data shows black and brown residents are disproportionately likely to be pulled over, receive citations, and to have police force used against them during a traffic stop. This does not result in safer streets, rather the opposite. The Stokes distrust among community members and law enforcement. HB 231 is one step in the right direction to taking policing out of traffic enforcement and focus more on automated systems, safe design and preventative actions to reduce traffic violations and eliminate traffic injuries and fatalities. We therefore urge the committee to uh, have a favorable vote on HB 231. Okay, th thank you very much. Next, Christy, uh, Christy Daphnis. Uh, Christy, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. And this is a bill that has no opponent. Unfortunately, I believe uh, both Christy and Jeremiah Pope are not on the call at the moment. Okay, well, we've got a question. Let's proceed oh, that. Uh, apologies if that was confusing. We do have one more witness who is uh, here at the moment, Amotamola. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, um, right, um, uh, Motomola, uh, please, go. you have two minutes. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Um, greetings. Uh, my name is Ahmad Mola Williams. Um, I'm a resident of Gaithersburg in Montgomery County. And um, I'm speaking on behalf, I'm testifying on behalf of Young People for Progress. Young People for Progress is a um, civil-based um, um, organization based in Montgomery County for people under 35 years old. We strongly support and urge passage of HB 231, um, MC 18-22 to enable Montgomery County to allow its Department of Transportation to oversee the, um, the automated traffic enforcement. When um, also like like to thank um, Delegate Clutchfield for uh, leading, uh, being the sponsor. Um, over the past, um, in the past decades, police are burdened with too many responsibilities outside of their uh, core duties. Moving automated traffic enforcement to the Department of Transportation, it will, this, this will allow the police to, um, to focus more on actual crime and um, allow automated traffic enforcement to be overseen by, um, by more uh, appropriate department. Modern police departments are responsible for an um, ever increasing number of government functions and services that almost have nothing to do with actual crime being committed. For example, um, think of a, of a man having an anxiety attack or, or a lady who, uh, who, who has a broken, who, who car, who, who car broken down on the road. Um, immediately people would, um, would call the police. So when, when uh, uh, emergency uh, responders or, or roadside assistance be a, a better, uh, better suit, so basically, basically, police departments are being pushed to be generalists instead of focusing on solving like actual crimes. Allowing other departments to take more, respons more responsibility for services around issues in which they specialize. If you could wrap up your testimony, the committee would appreciate it. Okay, so 
um, basically giving automated uh, traffic enforcement um, uh, under the Department of Transportation um, what is what we are um, serving for. And Alan, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, is Christy uh, Daphnis with us yet? Has she gotten in here? No? Okay. We'll I'm go here, Mr. Her. Chair. Are you waiting for me? If you're Christy Daphnis, I'm waiting for you, yes. Oh, sorry. Excuse me, sir. Delegate Lewis, I believe your bill will be after this. Yeah. Um, okay. We have a question from Delegate Healy. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to get on the record. Uh, when the statewide bill was passed, there was a lot of debate and decisions were made to make a police officer sign off on the tickets before they were mailed out so that uh, someone who was a sworn officer and had a stake in uh, making sure that it was accurate and true uh, and had some objectivity about it would be the person who would sign off on the ticket before it was mailed. This isn't about contact between a motorist and a police officer. This is sitting in an office looking at the, at the uh, photo ticket, photos that are taken of the camera from these cameras and deciding if they match the uh, legislation, which requires the, the license plate to be legible and so forth and match the car and all those kind of things. My question is, are you aware of all that uh, and how do you protect um, the, the public who are concerned about what was de described as a money grab by the local governments, by um, small municipalities that want to use uh, cameras to ramp up their revenue. Can you re address that so that we can be comfortable with this change? Mr. Chair, is it okay if I? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Oh, please proceed. So Delegate Healy, Healy, thank you for the question. And really what all this legislation does is it authorizes the movement of the automated traffic enforcement unit in Montgomery County only okay, from the police department to our Montgomery County Department of Transportation. That is it, that's all this does, okay? So would there still be a sworn officer signing off on the tickets? Currently is my understanding that what, what possibly could happen is that could also be moved over to let a silver, silver I can get a civil servant who, is in that department to actually sign off. That is a possibility that that could happen, okay? But however, right now, there is currently some coordination between the department, uh, the police department and that particular department in any event. Right now, there is coordination. Sure. Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure we had, when this law first went into effect statewide, uh, there were cases where Small towns had town administrators doing this instead of the sworn officers, and they ended up having to return all the money that they collected because they didn't do it right. So I want to make sure that uh, it, it, we dot all the I's and cross all the T's as we go forward with this. Thank you very so, much. So, okay. And so, Delegate Healy, I'm only aware of this actually being in place in one other jurisdiction in the state, and that is in Baltimore City. I'm sorry. Okay. Are there any other questions for uh, the sponsor of the bill? Seeing none, thank you very much, Delegate Crutchfield. That ends the public hearing on House Bill, 50, uh, House Bill 231. Uh, I understand Delegate Robin Lewis is with us, so we will go to House Bill 53. Uh, Delegate Lewis, welcome back to your old committee. Robin? Robin, is Robin Lewis in the... Uh, she's there, I'm just not sure if she can hear us for some reason. Robin. Thank you, sir. You? Okay. Welcome back to your old committee, Robin. It's always a pleasure to, be, uh, to come before you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and esteemed committee members. Um, for the record, I'm Delegate Robin Lewis. 
here to present House Bill 53, vehicle laws, dedicated bus lanes, prohibition and monitoring systems. Um, I refer to this as the better bus bill. House Bill 53 is a reintroduction of a previous bill, and that was House Bill 284. That was introduced and passed out of this committee and out of our chamber last year. House Bill 53, which is before you, is in the exact same posture as the bill you passed last year. Um, the bill before you is expected to have no fiscal note because last year's bill also had no fiscal note. Uh, this is a local bill for Baltimore City and it has no opposition. In fact, it's supported by the mayor of Baltimore City, the Baltimore City Department of Transportation, the Maryland Department of Transportation, and the Maryland Transportation Administration. This bill is the product of the 2019 the ded dedicated bus lane work group. That was a year long effort that resulted in recommendations that produced this bill. Um, I'd like to ask your favorable support. Uh, I would be welcome, happy to welcome any questions on this bill that you passed last year. Thank you. Okay. Okay. We also have Holly Arnold and Liam Davis who are going to testify, before, but before uh, I recognize them, uh, Delegate Lewis, you need to know that we can't do anything with this bill until we get a letter from the Baltimore City delegation reaffirming their support for it. So if you could. Thank you, sir. My yep. understanding is that such a, a letter was produced. Uh, we had problems with this last year where a letter was produced and somehow got lost in transmission. So I will absolutely take up the matter and make sure the letter reaches you. Okay. That, that's all we ask. Um, next up, Holly Arnold with uh, MDTA. Uh, welcome to the committee. I think this might be the first time that you are testifying before us uh, as the administrator. Hi, yeah, good afternoon, uh, Chair Barve. Uh, it is the first time and I appreciate you having me and allowing me to testify in support of this bill. Um, so again, thank you, uh, Chair Barbe, members of the committee, uh, for allowing me to be here today. For the record, uh, I'm Holly Arnold. I'm the administrator of the Maryland Department of Transportation, Maryland Transit Administration. Uh, and I am here today in strong support of House Bill 53. Uh, as you may know, MTA currently operates a 13-mile network of dedicated bus lanes in high-volume corridors in downtown Baltimore. Uh, we're very grateful to have Baltimore City's partnership in this endeavor as the streets our buses operate on are owned and maintained by the city. We utilize the dedicated bus lanes in heavily trafficked transit corridors. Uh, frequent bus service in our dedicated bus lanes carries more people per lane than the adjacent general purpose travel lanes. In February of 2019, MTA, in conjunction with many other stakeholders, released a study on the effic efficacy of dedicated bus lanes and it did show that transit travel times were about 9% faster on average after implementing dedicated bus lanes with savings of up to 32% on individual corridors. Additionally, the data shows that the dedicated bus lanes improve traveler safety, reducing the number of bus involved crashes by nearly 12% in those corridors. The Central Maryland Regional Transit Plan set goals to build 18 miles of dedicated bus lanes by 2025 and 30 miles by 2045. Uh, and through MTA's Fast Forward program and our uh, recently announced RAISE grant award, MTA and Baltimore City have identified potential locations for new dedicated bus lanes to improve the reliability and travel times throughout the Baltimore uh, link system. MTA has developed educational materials and signage to help drivers understand the role and benefits of the bus lane. And we've clarified when, other, when vehicles other than transit vehicles, bicycles, and emergency vehicles are permitted to travel in the bus lanes. Across the country, automated lane enforcement has become an essential tool to ensure the efficacy of travel in these lanes as constant police monitoring further strains limited resources and traffic stops can further contribute to transit delays. So far, enforcement of the dedicated bus lane has largely been done by MTA police in coordination with the Baltimore City Police Department and Baltimore City's transit enforcement officers. If you could start to wrap up your testimony, the committee would appreciate it. Yep, absolutely. Um, so, you know, while keeping those lanes available uh, is important, it takes our officers away from their primary task of maintaining public safety. Uh, photo enforcement of the bus lanes can achieve this goal while better utilizing officer time. You know, just to wrap up, dedicated bus lanes do offer the potential for increased speed, safety, reliability, and on-time performance for transit vehicles. And it's really important that we continue to invest in our bus mode. 
Um, so it's for these reasons that I would like to ask the committee for a favorable vote on House Bill 53, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, next let's recognize Liam Davis. Liam, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to stand by the testimony of Delegate Lewis and of Administrator Arnold. Uh, we are requesting a favorable um, you know, report from the committee. Um, thank you for considering this um, legislation and I'm available to answer any questions on behalf of Baltimore City Department of Transportation. Thank okay. you. Okay, well, we have one question from Delegate uh, Love, uh, Delegate Love. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Delegate Lewis, apologies if you said this and I missed this. Is this bill in the same posture as it was when we passed it last year? Yes, thank you for the question, Delegate Love. This bill is in precisely the same posture as it was passed out of this chamber last year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, again, we do need that letter from the city delegation and we'd be happy to accommodate you. Seeing no further questions, uh, Robin, you're free to go. And that's the end of the public hearing for that bill. We'll, Thank proceed, you. Yeah, we'll proceed to House Bill 368, Delegate Corman or Delegate Corman's uh, uh, aid. Uh, so, is somebody here for Delegate Corman? Mr. Uh, Delegate Corman is here for Delegate Corman, Mr. Chairman. Sorry to disappoint. Oh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> uh, well, I appreciate it, colleagues. Thank you. I'm before you the, uh, this afternoon with the Motor Vehicle uh, Registration Clarification Act, HB 368. Um, back when I had my first child, I received some notices from my insurance company saying we can't uh, pay for these uh, healthcare services because this person's not on your insurance. And that's because the person didn't exist until uh, that day. Uh, and I hadn't put them on yet. It turns out that the insurance company sent the bills out before uh, I had a chance to put the person uh, on my insurance policy. That person's Harrison, you can catch them on my Instagram feed or Twitter feed. Uh, this bill is going after a very similar concept uh, that was raised to me by a constituent where the Motor Vehicle Administration is so quick to send, send out notices that people lack uh, auto insurance and find them uh, that oftentimes these actually involve plates that have already been canceled. So of course the insurance has been canceled as well. They're surrendering their plates. They've canceled the insurance, but the insurance was canceled before the MVA processes the plates. So they get fines sent out to them. Now, of course, if you raise this with MVA, they will not charge you the fine. The fine is waived. But of course there are some people who have already paid the fine and it really shouldn't be on our constituents to sort of work that out with the Motor Vehicle Administration. So this bill basically puts sort of a grace period in place so that the MVA pauses before, um, before they go forward and uh, issue the fines. They note in their informational testimony, which I would refer to you, that they already have sort of an informal five-day grace period. This would extend that uh, to 10 days. I would say the fiscal note is a little uh, misleading because once again, these are really fines that people should not be issued in the first place. This is not changing what is and is not a finable offense. This is just extending uh, the period of time to avoid people sort of being misfined uh, accidentally. I appreciate again, MVA's informational testimony where they note that they uh, welcome this reform uh, as the inclusion will offer greater flexibility and expand the agency's premier customer service. I could not agree more. And I would ask that the committee uh, move favorable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll hear from Marceline White, who's with the uh, Consumer Rights Maryland Consumer Rights uh, Coalition. Marceline, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Is Marceline White in the house? Uh, that is a written only testimony, sir. Oh, is that written only? Oh, my mistake. Any questions for the uh, sponsor of the bill? Well, you did a hell of a job there, Mark. Uh, you have no opposition and um, and no questions. So that's that's the way it's done, huh? Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much. That ends the public hearing on House Bill 368. Let's proceed to House Bill 404, Delegate Lehman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to you and uh, Vice Chair Stein and my esteemed colleagues. For the record, I am Delegate Mary Lehman here asking for your favorable report on House Bill 404, authorizing local governments to lower maximum speed limits to 15 miles per hour after performing an engineering study. Um, we have heard multiple times in recent weeks that um, traffic fatalities are actually up right now in Maryland, and that does include pedestrian fatalities, which remain a serious problem. 
And of course, there are plenty of studies that show that the faster a car travels, the greater the chance for either serious injury or fatal injury. So the goal of this bill is to reduce these injuries and make Maryland roads safer by giving our local jurisdictions the authority to lower speed limits where it's warranted. So this is a statewide version of uh, last year's House Bill 562, which was a Montgomery County only bill. Um, and that a law passed on the third uh, try, but it gave only Montgomery County and its municipalities the same ability to lower speed limits um, to 15 miles per hour after an engineering study and traffic investigation. The bill was amended, <clears throat> excuse me, which a lot of advocates did not realize till they looked at my bill this year. It actually was amended over in the Senate. Uh, so of course we were not part of those discussions, but it was amended to say that speed cameras could not be added in these areas where the speed limit was lowered to 15. You're gonna hear some testimony, I think, from some advocates who are concerned by that provision. Nonetheless, that is in the law. We are not looking to change that with this bill. However, I did put in an amendment to clarify that language because it was a little confusing the way it was worded. It sounded as if there could be no speed cameras used in other areas where the speed limit was lowered from say 50 to 40 or 40 to 30. And that clearly was not the intent. Um, so basically pedestrian advocates after seeing the law passed for Montgomery said, you know, it, Montgomery, that's great for Montgomery, but it should not be the only jurisdiction in the state of Maryland um, that can lower its speed limit to 15 and and keep, um, you know, pedestrians and bicyclists and others um, safe. And so that's what this bill would do. And, and in summary, it's providing a tool. It's enabling legislation. It's providing a tool for local jurisdictions to increase um, pedestrian, bicycle, uh, driver, and passenger safety and it will hopefully um, put us on that path uh, toward our goal of uh, Vision Zero. And so I thank you for your consideration and I urge a favorable report. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from Tammy Bresnahan with uh, AARP Maryland. Tammy, welcome to the committee and you have two minutes. Uh, seems to be the theme today, Tammy is not on the call at the moment, unfortunately. Okay, how about Dominic Butchko? Oh, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you again for having me. Uh, Dominic Butchko here with Mako. Um, this is honestly just a great bill. Uh, counties are responsible for a ton of things already when it comes to roads. When there's snow, we put down the salt, we maintain them. If, um, when there's an emergency, we show up. Um, traffic enforcement, planning and zoning, et cetera. Um, HB 404, May Mako urges a favorable report um, and it's really just a way to keep our mutual cons uh, constituencies and our communities safe. So again, uh, Mako urges a favorable report. Okay, um, thank you very much, Peter Gray. I know you're here somewhere. Uh, welcome back and you have two minutes. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, WABA supports the passage of HB 404 and it's enabling of all jurisdictions to lower speed limits on state highways under certain conditions. Lowering speeds on roads is an essential element to reduce the incidence of crashes and the resultant fatalities and serious injuries stemming from those crashes. Furthermore, lower speed, lowering speeds in turn lessens the severity of injuries due to crashes. WABA also urges the committee to consider changes to the language in section A42, which prohibits the implementation of new speed monitoring systems under this law to allow for automated enforcement. Automated enforcement is proven to be an effective mechanism to get cars to significantly lower their speeds with the benefits mentioned above. Overall, allowing local jurisdictions to lower speed limits on state highways will give those localities an additional tool to reach vision zero goals by changing the conditions of the road and will reduce crashes and the severity of injuries from those crashes. So we urge a favorable report but also ask that you make an amendment to allow for the addition of speed monitoring systems at the locality's discretion. Hey, thank you very much. Um, uh, is Kathleen uh, Kufera, uh here? She, you're signed up favorable with amendments. Yes, good afternoon, Chair Barbie. Yeah, you've got two minutes. Welcome to the committee. Great, thank you. 
Good afternoon, Chair Barve and members of the Environment and Transportation Committee. For the record, my name is Keeling Kafara, and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. We are here today asking for a favorable report with amendment. The commission is charged with land use planning, park recreation in Montgomery County and Prince George's County. The commission improves the well-being of over 2 million residents and countless visitors within the region. And a part of that mission is that the commission is committed to prioritizing the safety of adults and children, whether walking, biking, or driving. Studies show a pedestrian struck by a car traveling 20 miles per hour has a 95% survival rate, but the probability of survival drops 60% if struck by a car traveling 30 miles per hour. The amendment put forward clearly would identify the commission as a local authority and establishes its authority to review and alter speed limits on its roadways. The ability to lower speed limits on a certain roadway to promote pedestrian and bicycle safety is critical to achieving Vision Zero goals. So I thank you for your time today and ask for a favorable report with amendment. Okay, uh, is uh, Tammy Bresnahan around? Bresnahan. Is she in? No, sir. Okay, all right. Uh, are Mr. There Chairman, I, we, we, I'm sorry, I just I wanted to let you know, we got a note that she is testifying over in the Senate right now, is hoping to make it, but she's not sure. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, any questions for the sponsor or any of the witnesses? I don't see any questions, so um, you come away unscathed, Mary, once again. That ends the public hearing on House Bill uh, 404, let's go to House Bill 434, Delegate Wells. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Delegate Melissa Wells, and HB 434 is a reintroduction of HB 941 from last year, which passed out of this committee and passed out of the House in this, in this same form, uh, but it did not make it through the Senate. I have made no changes to how it was passed out of, the, out of the house last year, but just to note the legislation will authorize the city of Baltimore to decrease or raise the previous level speed limits for roads based on the roadway type and industry best practice without requiring a traffic engineering study. Instances involving the raising of speed limits would still require a traffic engineering study. This bill also includes language that prevents local jurisdictions across Maryland from installing automated speed cameras on any road or highway where speed limits were lowered without the traffic engineering study. And with this, I ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Yeah, uh, what uh, what committee did it go to in the Senate? Uh, JPR. What a shock. What yes. a sh shocker. Okay. Um, any questions for the sponsor of this excellent bill that we passed last year? Okay, seeing none, you too get out unscathed. That ends the public hearing on House Bill 434. Next, let's go to House Bill 469, Delegate Carr and Layman. Delegate Carr, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yes, I can. Go, go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and distinguished ENT colleagues. For the record, I'm Delegate Al Carr, here to present House Bill 469. Unsafe driving behavior has been a concern of yours and mine for many years, and it's worsened during the pandemic. House Bill 469 will help make our streets safer. Under current law, a person who endangers our community by running a red light in one jurisdiction can do so with impunity if they live in a different jurisdiction. That's because of the difficulty collecting citations across state lines. House Bill 469 would enable a pilot program of reciprocity in the DMV region for red light cameras. How big is the problem? In Montgomery County from 2010 through 2018, 94% of the in-state red light camera citations were collected, while only 81% of the out-of-state citations were collected. Under the bill, an out-of-state driver could have their registration flagged for non-renewal if they failed to pay a Maryland red light camera citation, but it's a two-way street. Maryland drivers could likewise be exposed to reciprocity, uh, but this would only be for jurisdictions that had similar penalties. House Bill 469 is identical to House Bill 373 of 2020 that was heard in the abbreviated pandemic session. What is new this year is that the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments 
wrote a letter in December to the governors of Maryland and Virginia and to the mayor of the District of Columbia requesting action to address the problem of uh, enforcement across state lines. One, uh, if, if you like this idea, something you might wanna think about is, uh, is somehow incorporating uh, tolls. So um, in DC doesn't have any toll roads, but of course their drivers drive on uh, our roads and we need the toll revenue to uh, maintain those roads. Uh, as of August, DC drivers owed about $13 million to Maryland in unpaid tolls. Uh, so food for thought, in the interest of safety, I ask for your favorable report on this bill. Okay, um, it appears that nobody else has signed up to actually testify on the bill. Are there any questions for Delegate uh, Alcar? Let's see. I don't see any. Um, yeah, no, I don't see any questions for you. You're free to go. Thank you very much, Delegate Carr. Okay, so um, so that's the end of the uncontroversial bills. We will now turn to House Bill 487, which um, is sponsored by F Delegates Foley and Frazier Hidalgo. So uh, Delegate Foley, I, um, you, the floor is yours. You have four, four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I don't think I'm going to get off unscathed here. But uh, <laughs> for the record, I'm uh, Delegate Linda Foley, and I'm presenting HB 487, Commercial Vehicles Non-Consensual Towing Requirements. Um, this bill establishes certain requirements and procedures for, the st for state police-initiated towing of commercial vehicles, and also puts guardrails against unfair billing practices by commercial towers and the unnecessary hold on cargos. Um, the, this bill only applies to state roads, um, and it does the following. It requires the Maryland State Police to establish approved towing rates similar to what the Maryland Transportation Authority already does. It prohibits the use of per pound billing, which is based on a registered vehicle's weight plus the maximum load it's permitted to carry, and not on the actual weight of the vehicle or the work that was performed by the towing company. It gives vehicle owners and operators an option to choose their own towing company if the towing can be done safely and within a reasonable amount of time. Right now, the state police choose the towing company from a list that they have. It establishes a complaint process to ensure that towing companies charge fair and equitable rates for the service they provide. And most importantly, it prohibits towing companies from holding towed cargo as leverage for payment of disputed billing charges. Now we've worked with the opponents and supporters to find some common ground, and we've drafted some amendments with their help to present in subcommittee, including changing some of the terminology in this bill. We're committed to continuing to work with them uh, as we go forward. Um, let me just say that the supply chain crisis over the past two years has caused shortages in Maryland grocery stores. It's caused chip shortages that have caused cars and electronic products to soar in price. And Marylanders are experiencing shortages, excuse me, every day they go shopping. So holding cargo items garnered in a police initiated tow exacerbates the supply chain crisis in our state, which is why it's important that cargo be released in a timely and appropriate manner. I wanna point out that this bill is supported by a wide range of shipping companies and transporters of, of goods. The supporters include companies that deal with waste, shipping, retail, building, and various other industries. They all support this bill. The opposition seems to be coming from the towing companies. So let me just say this, most towing companies in the state of Maryland are good companies and they provide a very valuable service for us here in the state. This bill is aimed at bad actors. Um, and it, um, most towing companies are not bad actors. So I think this bill will have little effect on those who are doing things the right way. It's aimed at keeping, at, at putting guardrails around uh, companies that aren't doing things the right way. So Mr. Chairman, um, I urge a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hold on, okay. Uh, first, um, First witness is Mac Middleton. Mac, welcome to the committee. If only he was here. If he, only he was here. He had to go to the Senate. Maybe he'll come back in a little while. God, isn't it just that way with the Senate and our committee? Okay, um, Michael Matasek. 
Matichek. Yes, hello. I I, I can pronounce her name wrong. You can see me though. Um. Well, we can hear you though. So there you go. Yeah, that's even. You got better. two minutes. You got two minutes though. Thank you. I'm I'm Mike Matusik with the Owner Operator Independent Drivers Association. We represent. Uh, truck drivers and small motor carriers. We have about 1,700 members that live in Maryland and thousands more that operate on Maryland highways every single day. Uh, I want to make a few points. We refer to police dispatch tows as non-consensual tows because there's no opportunity to negotiate anything. This is not a normal business-to-business -business transaction. A service is provided for you and there's no cost controls no consumer protections and no meaningful recourse for people that are caught up in this situation. Despite what you hear from the opposition, this is a much bigger problem than, ju than just a few bad apples in the towing industry, both nationally and in Maryland. In fact, the fraudulent invoices we're seeing in Maryland are among the worst in the country, and it continues to get worse, both in the dollar amount and the frequency of which we see them. Uh, we're coming to the legislature as a last resort We've tried to work with the towing industry to address our concerns, but there's no reason for them to negotiate anything. The status quo means they can continue to charge whatever they want with impunity. Uh, the towing industry will oppose any meaningful legislative solution. We've seen this firsthand in other states, just as we're seeing it in Maryland right now. They've had ample opportunity to police themselves and they've failed miserably. HB 487 targets the bad actors. Towing companies that do things the right way should have nothing to worry about. There are plenty of other states that regulate police dispatch tows, and I'm not aware of any towing company that has gone out of business as a result of basic consumer protections, such as those included in this bill. Thank you to Delegate Foley for her support and efforts to finally address what has been a long-standing problem in Maryland. This concludes my testimony, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you very much. I understand that Mac Middleton is in the house now. Mac? Did I understand? In Thomas Middleton, somebody. Well, okay, we'll go to Lewis Campion. Lewis, you in the... I am here, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Lewis okay. Campion uh, with Maryland Motor Truck Association. You know, uh, $142,000 for one tow. Another tow that charged $83,000 for 90 minutes of work. Those examples and many more are in my written testimony. Unfortunately, they're not limited to only one tower, but many different companies. As already been said, we've been trying to work with the towing association and industry on this for five years. Um, and those challenges have been unaddressed. Towers will make many claims regarding this legislation. They'll say they can't comply, but they already are complying with this on the transportation authorities toll roads which have some of the most key arteries in our state for clearance. And in counties like Harford, Anne Arundel, and Montgomery, all of those jurisdictions already set pricing and provide basic consumer protections against these types of tows. And there are still plenty of tow operators who are willing to provide the service. The towing industry might say that when you go to the grocery store, you have to pay to get your goods. And that's true, but the difference is, is I get to go to the grocery store of my choice. And I know the price of the products when I decide to buy something. In every other industry, when the state tells you you must use a certain service provider, the state sets rate for that, electricity, water, right? Anything of those types of things, the state sets rates. That's all we're asking for. Towers will say this a matter of public safety. This bill only allows company to use their tower of choice if they can get there in 30 minutes or less, which is well within the state police's own target ranges. When you complain to the state police, the reaction from them is we don't regulate pricing, so we can't do anything about this. And I want to remind the committee that there is no tower who has to be on the state police list. They voluntarily choose to apply for that program. In my testimony, you will see 21 companies of all different types who have expressly authorized me to use their logos, announcing their support for this bill. I also encourage you to look at the diversity of shippers, retailers, trucking, construction, insurance, who are here in support of this legislation. It should give you an idea on how big this problem is, and we urge a favorable report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Lewis. I understand Mac is now with us. Mac, you there? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear and see you. Good to see you, Senator. It's great seeing you and all the members of the committee. First of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to testify. 
I was to leave this off, and most of what I've said has already been copied by the uh, people that have already presented. Uh, but I do want to thank uh, both uh, a delicate uh, Hidalgo Fraser and especially delicate uh, Foley for carrying this very, very important piece of legislation. The, the delegate did an excellent job of just laying this out one of the best I've ever seen. Uh, and, and in essence, what it does is it just prevents the bad actors from the overcharging of these uh, bills that they're assessed against some of these, a lot of times mom and pop operations, small companies that uh, OIDA represents. Uh, just a few things that I wanna leave the committee with that I don't think have been said is first of all, there are a lot of uh, local uh, in municipalities that have towing service. This has absolutely no impact on those whatsoever. And, and as a matter of fact, it has no impact on agreements that exist today between state police and some of the locals when it comes to the rates that are said on highways in those local jurisdictions. The other thing that it does, as has been said, it mirrors, it mirrors what's already at the Department of Transportation. And Delegate Foley and, uh, and her chief of staff were very kind to have two meetings to try to bring us together. Just a couple of things that were said, those uh, towing companies admitted that there's some bad apples out there. And that's exactly what this bill does. It does nothing more than tries to clean that act to rein them in. The other thing that was suggested is that we do an interim study. You know, members of the committee, and especially people like you, uh, uh, Delegate Barve, been around. We've seen bills a lot more complicated. This come in in the last week and get them resolved. So I think that we started a pattern to bring us together. The differences that we have, I'm feel sure that we can work out during the uh, uh, before the session ends. So we would ask that you give this bill a favorable recommendation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions should the committee or you have have of me. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Good seeing you, Mac. Uh, next, you. let me call up uh, Herman Funk. Herman, uh, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. And thank you for the opportunity to voice our strong support for House Bill 487. I'm Herman Funk. I'm general counsel at Cowan Systems. Cowan Systems is headquartered in Baltimore County, and it's the largest transportation provider uh, in the state of Maryland with 2,900 employees and contractors, and we operate 2,300 power units nationwide. Um, I think most of what I was going to say to describe the bill and, and what it's aimed at has, has been covered by others, so I'll just provide a couple of examples. Um, after a simple one-vehicle rollover accident in 2020, Cowan Systems was invoiced $72,000 by the tow operator for a tow that ordinarily costs about $25,000 to $30,000. The invoice in question used a fictional per-pound billing method and it included charges like miscellaneous truck stocking fees and charges for food and drinks of the tow operator's employees. Recently, I received an invoice from a Maryland tow operator that charged $2,500 per hour for the use of a rotator crane. Customarily, invoices for this equipment range from $900 to $1,200 an hour. After a recent crash, a tow company sent us two invoices, one for the tractor and one for the trailer each one in excess of $25,000. And this was just for towing a slightly damaged tractor and a completely undamaged trailer, approximately three miles. These invoices were also calculated using a fictional per pound billing method and a fictional 80,000 pound weight for our truck. Our truck actually weighed less than 36,000 pounds at the time of the crash. Invoices often include hourly charges for time spent waiting, they include administrative fees of, a th of thousands of dollars, and often equipment and cargo is unlawfully detained to compel rapid payment. These practices unfairly prey upon small businesses, and they require business to expend time and money in li unnecessary litigation. So we encourage the committee to favorably, favorably report the bill. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, uh, we're going to have the last witness who's in favor and I'll entertain questions for the proponents of the, of the bill and then we'll go to the opponents. So next, Matt Hines, um, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm the Director of Safety with Lightning Transportation in Hagerstown, Maryland. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today in support of House Bill 487. This bill can help protect Maryland's motor carriers and owner operators against predatory towing fees related to a police-initiated tow. 
This occurs when the police dispatch a tow company without the consent or knowledge of the motor carrier. We have experienced this on several occasions. When police initiate a tow, the tow company can charge literally any price they want to the motor carrier. Towing companies will hold both the truck and trailer with cargo until the entire bill is paid. The fees can be exorbitant and the delays on returning cargo and equipment devastating. In Baltimore City, I had a truck and trailer leaning against the utility pole on the driver's side. Two rotator trucks arrived and hooked cables to the truck and trailer, lowering it down on the passenger side wheels. It took less than one hour. Our driver drove the truck and trailer less than a mile back to our yard and dropped the trailer. The towing company called and demanded $11,000 for payment over the phone, which I declined and asked to speak to a supervisor. The tow company came onto our property, hooked to the loaded trailer with no permission and took it to their yard to hold hostage until payment was made. The laws of supply and demand and free market do not apply in the case of the police initiated tow, as there is no competition here. The motor carriers should be provided an opportunity to choose their own tow company, but if they defer to police, there should be guidelines in place on the amount of charges and the timely release of the motor carrier's cargo and equipment. On behalf of Lightning Transportation, my fellow Maryland trucking partners and owner operators, I urge you to pass this bill to put a stop to these abusive practices. Thank you. All right, we'll entertain questions for the proponents of the bill. First question goes to Delegate Weivel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Matusik, you made a comment that the situation is worse in Maryland than any other state. So I wanna direct this question to any of the proponents, not just you, but um, so I was kind of curious what actions might have been taken um, in other states to address the issue and how big the issue is in Maryland compared to these other states. Yes, thank you. And uh, sorry again that I'm having some camera issues, but uh, there are probably 15 other states or so that regulate this issue in a meaningful way. Uh, a lot of what you see in Delegate Foley's bill come from those other states. Um, and there's a couple of points I want to make is those states have some basic consumer protections in place, um, one of which is the ability to file a complaint. That's what Maryland lacks. Uh, one of a few things that Maryland lacks is, is, a, is an actual complaint process where uh, th that other states have. And in those states that have rules like this in place, there are very little issues that we deal with. Um, we've seen states like Colorado that have recently enacted rules like this. We've not filed, we've not had any issues in Colorado since the new rules have been in place and no tow company has gone out of business. Um, so as you, as you look at what other states have done, it works. It targets the bad actors. Um, there's a very minimal, if any, impact on tow companies that do things the right way. And what we're seeing in Maryland is this, just this proliferation of per pound billing um, being misused um, more than any other state in the country except Wyoming. So uh, the, the way some of these companies are using this, this pricing practice in Maryland is, is among the worst in the country. And there is absolutely no recourse whatsoever for a truck driver or a motor carrier that's caught up in this. So uh, Delegate Foley's bill would, would address a lot of those issues. It's things that other states are already doing and it's working. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I had another question. Um, not that it makes a difference, but do, do these exorbitant tows, are they covered by insurance or do they have to be picked up by the owner operators generally? It, it depends. Most of the time they're covered by insurance. If there is a, a, you know, some lack of insurance, ultimately the, you know, the truck driver or the motor carrier will pick up the difference, but by and large insurance covers most of these. I, I would, I would just add that the insurance that, that small trucking companies carry or that owner operators carry usually has a cap of how much they will cover. Okay. Um, and in, in my case, in our case, uh, we're a large company, we're self-insured. So we get involved in this much more in much more detail than your average trucking company because the money is coming directly out of our pocket. So we fight these things pretty strenuously. But oftentimes you'll find even tow companies will sometimes send multiple invoices to different insurance companies trying to get paid for the same thing by more than one party. That abuse has been going on for a while too. So there, there are a lot of, a lot of practices that need to be supervised here. 
Okay. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Next question goes to uh, Delegate Boyce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you, Delegate Oley and uh, Delegate Rachel Odago, um, for this bill. I had actually two questions. The first question was, um, and this is something that I know has happened before, even locally. I'm I'm in an accident uh, on a highway, and I call my insurance company, and they're on their way. Um, but what ends up happening is, you know, the police, or again, in this case, the state police, tow my vehicle for which. I then have to pay a personal cost versus my insurance paying that cost um, for me because it's a part of my service. Can we? Can you uh, talk a little bit more about this thirty-minute rule and when uh, uh, an officer, whether it's state or protect, uh, protect um, or local, would intervene to then decide that they would incur a cost on the individual versus um, allowing their uh, insurance to pay 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 for that. Mr. Chairman, I think if, it, if it's okay, I think I can yeah. answer most yeah. of the delegate uh, yeah, go ahead. question. Thank you. Um, so first of all, Delegate Boyce, uh, thank you for that question. Um, you know, there's a lot, if you're like me, there's a lot here involved about towing. Um, and uh, and it, it's a little complicated, but um, first of all, I, I don't think this, this bill would not apply to you if you broke down on the side of the road. This is just for commercial vehicles. So same difference though. Okay. 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 Um, so um, in terms of the 30 minute limit in, that's in this bill, that is only if the, t the, um, the shipper, the commercial vehicle, the owner of the commercial commercial vehicle decides that they want to uh, have their own tower. They want to pick the tower. And that just simply puts a parameter around, you know, you can't pick your own tower and then sit there for two hours um, they have to be there within 30 minutes and it has to be safe for that to happen. So that's what the 30 minutes is about. Um, and in terms of the insurance questions, I'm going to let one of the other experts uh, respond to that. Yeah, who would like to answer that? So I'll, I'll actually jump in, Mr. Chairman. So actually, I, I don't think that's the same on passenger car pieces. Um, Delegate Boyce, I think that the insurance still would cover this type of claim, even if the tow operator did not, I mean, excuse me, if the trucking company did not get to select the tower of choice. The big thing around the 30 minute provision is that if we're allowed to select our tower of choice um, and can do that and they can get there in a safe period of time, then all the provisions of this bill actually go away. There's no price caps because then it's true free market in that I hired you to perform a service and now I'm responsible to you for payment of that service, as opposed to on a police initiated tow, we have no role in the selection of the tower. They show up, take our equipment and car cargo we don't even own. Uh, in many cases, the trucking company doesn't own the cargo, and then they're holding a third party's cargo to demand payment. So it, as long as we can have that choice uh, and they can arrive in a safe time frame, then you know, it would be responsibility of the motor carrier and his insurer to make payment for that service in accordance with whatever. Um, thank you for that. I, I just know that in some on, on state highways, I mean, I got um, years ago on my way to uh, the Outer Banks, my car broke down on a bridge over water. Um, pretty scary. But before I knew it, their highway patrol people came and just towed me to a location and then I could you know, get to where I need to go then. So I guess we can start discuss more th about that. I I'd like to ask a question to essentially um, anyone who can answer it are really about like, what, what happens when your company tries to contest a tow charge? Well, I, 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 can, uh, I can speak to that. This is Herman Funk. Um, we have uh, over the last few years, these towing charges, I mean, Historically, towing charges were sometimes high and sometimes an annoyance, but over the last few years, it's gotten to be critical. And uh, what I do is I'm forced to hire counsel in the locality of where it happens. And if it's in, if it's in Maryland, we have some firms that we work with. We typically contact the towing company and ask them to moderate their bill. And we tell them what we think is a reasonable amount based on our experience. If we can come to an understanding then we pay it. If we can't come to an understanding, we file suit. And 
we have in several instances filed suit um, uh, in order to encourage the towing company to negotiate a reasonable price with us. Now, I, I'm somewhat fortunate in that we're a big company and we can afford to do that. We have the personnel and the resources to do it. If you're a, if you're a small operator or an owner operator uh, with one truck, you don't have the ability to do that. You're, you're pretty much stuck. If you want your truck and your cargo, you pay the bill and take your lumps. And that bill, of course, is going to include um, storage for whatever. Yes, that's the other thing. They, they say, OK, fine. Well, well, you can contest the bill if you want to, but I'm charging you three hundred and fifty dollars a day until you pay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, general towing as well. Um, did, did Mr. Hines want to add to that? Well, um, some of the other other charges uh, outside of the towing company that you know motor carriers uh, can see is uh, in the case of containers, you have per diem charges. Uh, there's so many amount, so many days of free days that, that we're allowed to have that container out of the port. And once those free days expire, um, it's 150 to 300 dollars a day uh, per diem charges that we would, you know, be responsible for on top of the towing fees. Uh, so um, that's that's all I have to add on that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is uh, Delegate Foley's first bill, and a classic legislative hazing ritual is where we all ask questions. So, all right, uh, Marlon, do you have a question, or are you just uh, yeah, uh, hazing? <laughs> I actually have a quick question. I mean, I, okay. I, I, I think Doug, your voice kind of got to where I was going to ask. And um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to get a better understanding from those who have received these these crazy bills. Um, what are what are the if you receive something with some better line iteming, what are the what, what, what portion of the bill are you seeing this inflation of cost? And um, just thinking about that in the context of I know that the rate that you have in the language of the bill takes into, I was just looking at it now, I don't have it up, but I, you know, I don't think it took into account like fuel cost or other things that would be put into that rate. So I just want to make sure that whatever rate we put together uh, doesn't allow there to still be a way to, to snake around it and create some other fee that these, that they can still add. So I just want to get an idea of what, where are you seeing in these bills is the big inflation of, of cost? Well, what's, if, if I may, what, what's going on, uh, predominantly right now is that they avoid all of that by saying, we're going to charge you 28 cents a pound to tow your truck, regardless of what they have to do, whether it's a simple tow or whether it's a recovery uh, in turning the truck over and cleaning up the mess. So you don't know what they're, what they're, what costs they're really incurring to do that. Now, in other cases, they charge a, an hourly fee for each piece of equipment that's used Frequently, you'll see uh, fuel surcharges added. Fuel surcharges are common in the trucking industry, but you know, for a for a tow that takes three or four hours, maybe uh, to see a fuel surcharge that's twenty percent of the cost uh, is is just shocking. You know, there's just no way that the cost of fuel costs that much. So there's a variety of ways to skin the cat. You know, what we need is some guidelines to say, this is how much you can charge by the hour for the use of the equipment and for the personnel. Got it. Uh, this, this is Mike Matusik. I, yeah. I just want to add, you know, we submitted two invoices with our written testimony, one of which uses a, a price per pound of 95 cents per pound. So wow. uh, multiply that by 80,000 pounds and, <sighs> and you'll quickly realize just how big of a bill that can be. And so, uh, the way that price per pound is being used in Maryland is not how it was ever intended to be used. Um, if you talk with people in the, in the industry that that know about the history of per pound billing, it, it is just being uh, used and abused in Maryland. Like, you know, like, like I said, there's only the only other state I can think of where this type of billing is even remotely close is, is the state of Wyoming. So uh, that said, even the even tow companies that use the hourly uh, hourly billing practices, their hourly prices on their equipment are just outrageous. Uh, they're trying to recover their expenses in a matter of hours. Um, so it, there, are, there are a number of ways to um, that they're abusing the system. What I want to add is 
nothing in the bill would um, mitigate 100%, you know, people from taking advantage of the system, but it would do a lot to, uh, I mean, there would be a complaint process. Um, so it would stop a lot of it, but not all of it. Um, and so I just wanted to make that point. Um, again, what we're seeing in Maryland is just absolutely crazy. Got it. Thank you so much. All righty, then. It appears that there are no more legitimate questions. We'll go to the opponents uh, to the bill, and that, uh, and we'll start with Charles Parrish with the Vision Record Service. Charles, um, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Is Mr. Parrish with us? I got it now. Can you hear okay. me? Okay. All right. Welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Good morning. Thank you again. Nice to see everybody. Delegate Foley, great to see you again. Um, I've been doing this for 30 years, especially the non-consensual towing, and it's always hard to argue whenever language is coming in against rogue towers, those that are abusing the system. So in no way am I defending that. I'm not. Um, some things that were said, though, that do bother me as a member on the Legislative Committee for Towing Recovery Professionals of Maryland is the comments that we've been working with last resort. Yesterday, besides one other meeting that our association had, it's the only meeting I've ever been involved in. And when we had our meeting last night with the association, those members who have been on there a very long time as well have only talked to the ones uh, supporting this bill one other time. But in no way, like I said in my um, downplaying anything they're saying. I just feel this bill doesn't address, nor will it stop the bad pricing, the bad towers. It does affect, because um, I've heard that too, it's not going to affect the good guys. It will affect us. The way this is written, for one, if I'd like to know who's going to establish the rates. And if these rates are established, why then would they have the option of not paying me because they don't want to pay it? Um, that I, I don't feel. And if we're going to do that, then where is our protection? Because over 30% of my tow bills don't get paid and aren't enforced by the insurance companies because they're not based in Maryland. And uh, the insurance commission in Maryland has stated that they don't have the jurisdiction to force them to pay it. So then I end up getting scrap prices, which is nowhere near the cost of the bill, the training and the time. So I do want to thank Delegate Folio for changing the definition. I really, that was my main concern. I appreciate that very much. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll uh, turn to Deborah Sullivan of the uh, Towing and Recovery Professionals of Maryland. Deborah, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Thank you for this opportunity and to be before the committee. I am the uh, treasurer of the Towing Recovery uh, Professionals of Maryland um, secretary, and I'm also a third generation tow company co-owner in Baltimore and Hartford County. Um, we've been in business since 1958. We've seen a lot of changes over the years, the roadways, infrastructure, the volume of the commuting traffic, as well as, um, laws and we are very fortunate that in 2015 we were actually included in the first responders law when we worked with senator jacobs and delegate jim malone on the um, move over law to include the tow the towing recovery professionals as first responders we in fact are the only first responder that are the private sector we do not receive any government funding for anything that we do we complete permits and contracts. And on some of those, uh, we are required, such as with the MDTA, to provide certain pieces of equipment for our uh, work that we do. So none of this, of course, helps cover the cost of doing business in the state of Maryland. Um, we also participate in the, with MDOT, Maryland dot chart program which is the Coordinated Highway Action Response Team. So we are given calls dispatched for accidents and we need to respond in a timely manner. We need to bring the equipment. Oftentimes they tell us which equipment to bring. Other times we send um, trucks and respond accordingly. 
Oftentimes, instead of getting paid, our insurance companies dispute the bill and oftentimes walk away from the bill. Cargo, in most cases, in these extraordinary crashes, is the only valuable piece um, left of the load. So oftentimes, towers are not getting paid. If you could begin to wrap up your testimony, the committee yes. would appreciate it. So we appreciate um, the opportunity to speak. And if you reconsider um, and relook at not tow bill 487, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, let's turn to Wayne Sullivan. Uh, uh, Wayne, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes, sir. Yes, uh, my name is Wayne Sullivan. Thank you all of you for letting me be in here. I um, am part of this problem that they're calling about, and I have some issues. I keep hearing people say it's tow bills, it's tow bills, it's not. It's recovery bills. When they say this simply is uh, a pickup and go, and it took them uh, five miles, some of these things that they're talking about, which is very annoying, is tractor trailers that go down over a bank, fully loaded, takes out tree, takes out guard rail, takes out light poles. Now you got to recover that. You're not out there with one piece of equipment, two pieces. You're out there with several pieces of equipment to clear these accident scenes, which they keep calling toes. Now, with that being said, the price per pound has been around in this country for 36 years. And a lot of people use it because it's a simplified way to bill it. It mirrors the hourly rate. Now, I hear somebody say that they can't understand why we're paying so much an hour for a piece of equipment. That piece of equipment costs a million dollars and plus. In some states, you have to have a truck that can't be more than five years old. So every five years, you have to replace that million dollar piece of equipment. Some states, you're told that you have to respond with a certain amount of equipment. So with this being said, they say it's an extraordinary amount of money being paid, but the the towing companies, the professional recovery companies that are out there are spending a ton of money to clear the highways for the state. If you take that chance away where they can build properly, then your state's going to have a problem trying to get things recovered. All I'm saying is consider this because it's not just a tow. It is a recovery. It's a cleaning up the mess on the highways that's recreated. And the uh, insurance companies fight you on every term. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to work it out. But the problem is Maryland Motor Truck never came to us to try to work anything out. And that aggravates me. We met with them one time. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Let's next turn to John Collins. Uh, Mr. Collins, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes, sir. Hi, thank you. My name is John Collins, TRPM Southern Regional Director in Workers Towing and Recovery. I oppose this bill. The towing industry is considered a first responder along with fire, rescue, and police. However, we mentioned earlier, we are privately funded. In order to keep the roadways open and traffic flowing in a timely manner, the cost of equipment and training is very expensive for this task. If we can't get our services paid, the Maryland citizens and economy will suffer significantly with the roads being closed. By passing this bill, it'll put a great strain on the towing industry, and it might cause many towing, towing companies to go out of business. Please reconsider this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, let's turn to Vince uh, Fluke. I think I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, Vince, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. All right. Um, one second here. We can All see right, it. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for, for having me. Um, there's a couple of things I just want to say. They talk about holding things hostage. Um, th there's a federal bill where they can bond it out. If, if they don't like the bill, they can bond it out, hire camp counsel, and um, let, let the judge decide what, what's fair and what's not fair. Um, Lewis from TRP or from uh, Maryland Motor Truck says he's, he's met with us many times and this, that, and the other. That's all bogus. Um, they have our information if they want to reach out and talk to us that they can. They've done this completely behind their back. We didn't find out about it until the 11th hour. Almost no time to react. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, and as far as the, ba the bad actors go and the bad apples, um, and most are good, they say, um, th this is going to affect everybody. And I can tell you, 
at the point that I have something towed, if I just don't have to like the bill to, to not pay for it, nobody's going to like any bill. And like the other, I think Charlie had said, if, if the bills are going to be regulated, um, why do they have the option of paying it or not paying it? If they're going to be regulated, they need to, uh, they need to pay every single bill that there is. With that said, I would strongly suggest to um, vote against this bill and let us get together and actually have real meetings and try to work this out and get something that works for everyone. I'm not in a disagreement. So there's not some bad apples and there's not some problems. But if we actually work together, I think we can fix it instead of just saying that we work, we tried to work together because that's not true. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, let's turn to Thomas Showalter. Thomas, uh, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes, sir. Do we have Thomas Showalter uh, in the, in the uh, uh, waiting room? All right, let's he go is on. in the call, but I don't know if he is currently. I'm here. Hello. Okay, we can Hello. hear you. I'm we sorry. Can... We can hear you. I you know my name is Tom Showalter. I'm the owner of the Auto Barn and Charlie's Towing in Prince George's County. First of all, I want to say thank you all for letting us speak. I have a list of things here. One is, is we're not talking about basic tow. We're talking about recovery. We're talking about what equipment costs today. We all would like to live back in the 1950s and 60s, but unfortunately today, what it costs to recovery of a vehicle is equipment. To pick up 80,000 pounds what went over a guardrail down an embankment takes a truck that will lift 80,000 pounds. That truck's a minimum of a million dollars in today's world. Not like before when you could buy a tow truck for $100,000, way different. So please think about these things. Most of the time they talk about waiting on the highway. We did a recovery tractor and trailer full of hazmat rolled over. By the time they found a company that could deal with the hazmat, four, five, 10, 15, 20 hours went by. We were up there for three days while they had to pump it out, but they wouldn't let us leave. The state of Maryland wanted us to stay there. We had to. Well, we have to keep all of our equipment on scene and all the people that we're paying. Think about what that cost is. <clears throat> when we get paid from an insurance company, again, anybody in here, I don't believe any of us good towers, will sit down and have a conversation with anybody. Please keep that in mind. <clears throat> we would also like to think if a company is allowed to call their own tower, say that tower shows up, tractor and trailer cross the road, they can't get it. Then what's going to happen? They can't get it up. They don't have the proper equipment. Who's going to regulate that? Right now, we do know the state police that have this list. We are qualified, and we do get the job done. Some people might not like what it takes, but this is a different world today. Trucks cost more. People cost more. Think about what that hourly rate is. What a customer. Our insurance is more. Think about what that costs. <clears throat> I would like to have a meeting with anybody. Let's open up what things really cost in today's market or what they're, they're trying to compare us to stuff 50 years ago. It's totally different now. Again, I would love to sit down with everybody. I know I'm out of time. Thank you very much. I've totally opposed this bill. Thank you, sir. Um, let's next turn to John Hessman. Uh, Mr. Hessman, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Yes, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to touch on the, the term non-consensual tow. It should only apply to trespass towing and parking, you know, predatory practices for, you know, parking enforcement, not the emergency towing of a tractor trailer, the emergency recovery of a tractor trailer. Regulating these rates would be anti-competitive and ultimately hurt the consumer and business and deter market competition. Uh, touching on price per pound, price per pound was designed to limit the ability to milk the clock, adding unnecessary equipment to an incident and creating billable hours. Price per pound is a way of determining how to adjust the pricing structure based upon the weight, the factors that are involved. I've heard testimony that the invoices do not show line items. In its original form, the price per pound has line items of the factors that are involved, typically related to a tractor trailer incident off the road, in a ditch, overturned, 
submerged, upside down, hazardous materials. All of these are factors with a numerical association based on your business to calculate the dollar amount in which it takes. Uh, we should not be penalized for investing in training, equipment, uh, going above and beyond to perform a service by performing our job quicker, faster for the motoring public. If it takes a half hour to do a job because we invested millions of dollars worth of equipment versus 10 hours because we came out with less than adequate equipment. I oppose this bill and think it needs to be reviewed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next we'll turn to Andrea Mansfield. Andrea, uh, welcome back to the committee. You have two minutes. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Andrea Mansfield with Manus Canning and Associates. I'm representing the Towing and Recovery Professionals of, of Maryland. Um, I know you've heard um, quite a lot um, fr from the members and I, I have a few points I, I would like to make. Um, I guess one I would like to say, uh, TRPM definitely understands the importance of this issue. And we really do appreciate the conversations that we've been having with the sponsor, as well as um, other industry uh, participants on, on this issue. And I'd say, Delegate Foley, we do appreciate, I know you have some amendments. Uh, one is to remove um, the definition of non-consensual towing and change that to police-initiated towing on state roads. And we do we appreciate that change. Um, I think some of the, the main concerns um, with this bill, I think is that it, in some areas, it is definitely, it's lacking um, more specificity and kind of, it will, will affect operations. If there's language in the bill um, where MSP would, would set, or I guess approved a, a, the rates to be used, but there's no process um, to do that. I think um, for my client, that's a big concern because they feel that they have, they have expertise, they understand the issue and it's really, you know, MSP may not be the appropriate body. It should be a body of, of those in the, working in the industry to determine how those rates are set. Um, you know, doing away with the per pound billing. Um, you know, per pound billing is a common um, method used. I mean, FedEx uses it, UPS uses it um, for shipping packages, and it is a common method. Um, and I think my client would say maybe there are, maybe there could be some better ways, but they really, but the industry needs to be a part of that and there needs to be an understanding of what goes into heavy duty towing and the expenses of the equipment and the time and what's associated with that to help determine those rates. And that, that process is not here in, in this bill. Um, I think the uh, one area that is extremely concerning for them is where if there is a dispute over the fees, um, the owner operator of the, um, of, the, the, of the truck or that heavy equipment vehicle, they would be able to come and remove their, the cargo and the vehicle from, from the storage yard without any, without any payment at all um, until, you know, until that dispute can be resolved. So essentially that's saying, you know, the, now the tow truck company, a professional went out and did the work. And now if there is a dispute, they're not, they won't receive any payment for that work until they somehow there's a resolution with that dispute. So that is if a major concern for them. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I would say um, we look forward to continually working cooperatively with, with the sponsor as well as the committee. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next we'll uh, hear from Keith Reagan. Uh, Keith, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Unfortunately, I don't believe he is here today. Okay, how about Jeffrey Hurley? Jeffrey Hurley. Uh, okay, how about Joanne Bly? Uh, Bly uh, Jeffrey Hurley is on the call. It looks like he's trying to unmute at the moment. Okay, all right. Well, we'll, we'll wait for Jeffrey. Hello. Okay, we can see you and hear you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak. Um, current president of Town Recovery Professional of Maryland, and also the owner of Jess Jr. and Sons LLC, which is Body Shop and Town Recovery and Jay Brothers on the Eastern Shore, Maryland. Um, we have not been contacted um, for any meeting concerning the, the, with the other, some of the other tellers that told you from the Maryland motor truck or the insurance industry. And we, in some of the recent last week or so meetings, Zoom meetings with the delegates and other people, we have extended, I've offered to extend the Olive Branch out to sit down and meet with those people and I believe we can come to an agreement that would suit everybody, including the consumers. Um, 
And it's going to take some time. I think it's going to take, you know, probably a year, at least several months. Um, the, the big thing is that in this bill, there's, uh, according to what our lobbyist has already said, there's no provision. Maryland State Police knows nothing and doesn't want to set the rates. I think it needs to be an independent tow board made up of people appointed maybe by the governor, attorney general's office, consumers, the tow industry to help set and regulate if we're going to do these prices. And also, if, when a complaint's filed, that they can review it and take the appropriate action so that it's fair across the board. A lot of it is not enough knowledge on both sides of the board uh, of, the, of this bill. So I would say at this time, the way it's currently written, written um, I would be unfavorable for it only because there's not been a lot of discussion and we have met one time in the past with Maryland Motor Truck and a couple of Maryland trucking companies when they had high bills in other states to which we helped get resolved. I appreciate your time and allowing us to speak. And I think there is an opportunity to make it better for everybody, including the consumers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Let's next go to Joanne Blyton. Joanne, uh, are you with us? I am, bear with me, I'm electronically okay. challenged, trying to get unmuted. I hope I'm not echoing like the message has come to me. You are, you are echoing a bit. And I don't know how to, I'm not on my cell phone. Well, let's just go ahead and try and do your okay. testimony. Turn if, off the YouTube. If you yeah, if you're, you if you have, right, if you have YouTube on right now, turn that off. Okay. Well, you, you, you sound great now, I think. Mr. Chairman and the Honorable. No, oh, no, hold on, Joanne. I think you've still got YouTube on. The te you've got. I think I think she turned down her computer. Like turned down the volume on the computer. Right. right. Exactly. Okay. This That's is just it. the meeting itself coming okay, back. Okay. Can from you hear speakers. me now? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Can go you ahead. Hear me? Yeah. It's I. No, I, it's it's really bad. It's been bad on my end to hear people. Hmm. Well. What, what is a solution? Somebody help me. Uh, there may not be a quick solution for this. Other, if you, I would say turn your computer down, your volume down as low as it can go, and that's the only quick solution I wonder that may if, work. wonder if the speakers... Um, no, turn, turn the volume down to nothing so that you won't have any sound coming through your uh, computer, but we'll still be able to hear you. I'm wondering if my speakers are creating creating bleedback. I was trying to check. No, I'll tell you what. Um, we'll, we'll go to Barbara Zach. Uh, Zach Can you hear me now? You still got a lot of echo. Does it? I'm sorry. I am electronically challenged, and it has been horrible to understand people on this hearing today. And I was so happy to be amongst the honorable group here to be able to testify about our industry, have 38 years experience currently serving as the leader of the Tow and Recovery Association of America. Can you hear me at all? And is it any better at all? It's a little better. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. It's a little better. Go ahead. Okay, so I'll go ahead. Thank you. And I apologize for that. Uh, it is a pleasure to be amongst this distinguished group this afternoon, and I would like to thank the Honorable Delegate Foley and Frazier, and I hope I don't mess the name up too bad, Hildego, that they want to fix a problem to protect the motoring public, and we all get that. And my question is, do we have statistics to prove how large the problem truly is? TRAA's goal here with this group is to work with all parties to come to a reasonable solution. There are good bills and there are bad bills. HB 487 in its present form should not be passed. Let's first realize that our industry loses an operator every six days on our roadways. Number one concern for us is safety for us and for our customer. Federal Highway just published numbers showing roadside line of duty deaths for 2021 at 65. In 2020, the number was 46. 
the carnage on our highways has to stop. Now, since the issue addressed is pricing, how about the issue of adequate insurance for coverage for trucking companies? Price per pound is an industry standard for trucking. They bill their customer price per pound. Post office uses price per pound. The ag industry sells meat by the pound. FedEx, UPS, by the pound. Um, there are good and bad towers in, in our arena, and we all realize that. However, to paint us with a broad brush across the industry is dead wrong. House Bill 487, if completed with answers on how and who will control the outcome of the situation, might be one answer for this bill. Requiring pricing publication could be another. Well, I don't personally support that, but um, I would post my rates if I was asked to. A minimum to maximum that that on this situation and dispute over the invoice, the owner of if you could wrap up insurance company can bond out the casualty to protect businesses is another answer. Ma'am, you could wrap up your testimony. But... by uh, Federal Highway offers incentives for towers when they do the job quickly, and that requires high dollar equipment. I would like to just, I know I need to wrap up. Let me just paint you a picture, please. Take I-95, 270, 495, 695, Maryland 301. I'm sure Joey Sagal with Maryland Department of Transportation could get you vehicle counts for those highways. Look at the traffic. Now a crash occurs, blocks all southbound ma lanes. If you can, if you can, are asked to deploy, and what happens next? Yeah, ma'am. Thinking about the Canadian border issue, our state here in Montana can, has we, a tow truck resolution. I guess she's got her sound we, off. We can mute her mic if you'd like. These issues. Uh, I know I've probably run over time. I apologize for that. And answers exist, but not through bad legislation. And thank you for allowing me to testify. Okay. Uh, last witness is Barbara, Barbara Zektik. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Barbara Zektik, president of ZNC. I'm here on behalf of a number of tow companies based in the Baltimore area, Frankfurt Towing, Mel's Towing, Ted's Towing, and Tober's Towing. Um, and I myself have some experience in this area. I worked with this committee in 2009 on reforming trespass towing at the state level. Uh, 2012 for Baltimore City as their general counsel of their transportation department. I worked alongside Baltimore Police and holistically reforming the Baltimore Police uh, tows and their procurement process. And I served as general counsel for the Baltimore City Trespass and Tow Board. So I'm familiar with towing and I wanna take this opportunity to make sure we're abundantly clear what we're talking about here. Because first, and some of this is gonna be echoing what a lot of my friends have already said, but first we're talking about first response situations. We're talking about huge crashes on public highways. And we're not even talking about normal cars, we're talking about commercial vehicles. So we're talking about overturned tractor trailers that cause fires, and spill hazardous materials on our public roads. So that's why there has to be a tow truck driver that responds within 30 minutes of being called. That's why this is designed so the Maryland State Police are overseeing these services. Um, and that's why it's abundantly important that we make sure these tow companies can continue to provide this service at rates that are fair, because this is really not all that different than saying this is how much we're paying for a fire truck. Are we going to send three fire trucks to a fire or just one and save the cost? The bill is absolutely well intended. I absolutely believe that we can come to a resolution on a lot of these issues. Andrea did a great job dispelling some of the issues in the bill. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a service provided by the Maryland State Police to the people of Maryland to keep our roads safe. Having this conversation without Maryland State Police at the table is just kind of strange, frankly. Um, and there are many opportunities to oversee this, make sure it's fair. Um, but uh, just dropping this bill is frankly just not the way. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got several questions. The first goes to Delegate Sarah Love. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm following up on a couple of comments that have been made about holding cargo, and that's a way to hold, basically hold companies hostage to paying, but what if the cargo is owned by a different company? How is that fair to the company 
who owns the cargo. Does anybody uh, want, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Delegate Love, thank you for that question. Um, so yes, you are correct. Uh, the cargo often is not owned by the company that's shipping or the company that owns the truck. And that's part of the problem um, from holding the cargo. And I'm gonna ask um, maybe Lewis Campion to weigh in here as well. But well, I, I, I really want to limit questions as much as possible to the opponents to the bill because we already had questions to the proponents. Uh, right, but I was going to let him answer her question. Her, oh, I see what you mean. Okay. I was well, actually asking the opponents, but thank you, Delegate Foley. Sorry. Um, so, um, so anyway, I just wanted to point out that in terms of the opponents' uh, points on this, uh, well, hold we on, have, Delia Foley, you can't rebut the opponent's points at this no, point. No, I'm, I'm not going to, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll stop control. talking. Yeah, no, it's fine. Uh, go ahead. Uh, 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 I forget it's, the name of the person. This is Jeff Hurley, okay. uh, the president. Uh, in, in a lot of tractor-trailer accidents, there can be up to four or more insurance companies involved, uh, one for the tractor, one for the trailer, one for if it's a container, uh, but one for the cargo. Uh, all these people are aware they use brokers and all of us are supposed to have proper oh, insurance. Lord, can help you. And um, um, to uh, take care of covering their portion of the bill. You called me. I'm the with problem the being a lot of companies. Hold, hold, are, hold on, hold on. Um, sir, can you uh, mute everybody who's not talking? Uh, ben, do you have the ability to do that? All right, hold on, let me get Chris, hold on a second. And it's Tom Showalter. Oh, all right. We'll find a way to mute him. I, mu I muted Tom Showalter. Okay, great. Uh, go ahead uh, with your answer. So uh, it takes some coordination. That's why when we say there's a lot more to this, the, all the companies have to come in. Some companies are underinsured. Some companies have enough insurance that, that insurance companies that insure uh, thing and all this has to be worked out to who's paying for what so that the bill is properly after negotiated being paid. I don't think any of the good companies are intentionally hold any cargo or don't allow people to see the cargo or to shape at least not that I'm aware of that I've been made aware of they, although there I'm sure there may be some out there but that's how when you when you ask the question about holding a cargo, they're not holding a, um, the cargo hostage as far as keeping it. It's all part of figuring out who's paying for what. Are you good, Sarah, or do you have a follow-up? That's okay, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Next question goes to Delegate Weivel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had two questions. Actually, Delegate Love, that was my first one, but I still don't think I got an answer. I heard an answer because... Um, I believe it's Deb Sullivan. You talked about holding the cargo. Um, it, I just wondered what the legality of that is. And maybe that's a question for the uh, subcommittee, but seems to me it's a legal question, maybe. Unless Ms. Sullivan, you can answer that. It is legal to hold cargo that's owned by a third party, not the uh, truck or the trailer owner. I do not think I addressed the legality of holding the cargo. I said, oftentimes, the only valuable piece left of these catastrophic accidents is the cargo. I was just noting that fact. I'm not stating any legality. Were there several parties, <clears throat> once an accident like this happens, generally you're speaking to the, the, track, the trucking company Sometimes the trailer's owned by someone else. It could be an independent owner of the truck itself. And then you're also speaking to the cargo owner. So, so there's several so when different- you, So when you made the comment, the only thing of value may be the cargo, you weren't insinuating that your company holds the cargo. No, no, hold okay. the cargo. We speak to, we try to negotiate with all parties. And like I said, and as, a, as our president, Jeff um, Hurley stated, there are several parties that come into factor. You're just not towing, hooking up and towing right. back. Up. All right. Thank you. And then I believe it was Wayne Sullivan. You made a comment that a lot of states have a five-year 
equipment replacement requirement. Is Maryland one of those? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Well, to follow up on something that you asked about the legality of holding, uh, I can give you some research. It would be Crete Trucking versus Sullivan's Garage, and that will give you the answer that you're asking for. All right. Okay. Thank you. We will yes, have sir. our council look into that. Uh, Delegate Boyce. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you, uh, Delegate Weibel, for asking the question about the equipment um, uh, provision. Is there a provision in the state that equipment has to be um, renewed every, if it's not five years, is it every eight or a 10? Or, or is there just no provision at all? To answer you on that question, I would have to say that there's a provision that they inspect your vehicles every year. If they don't meet their requirements, you have to replace it. Yeah, okay, that, that's fair. Um, and then my next question is, is uh, and, I, and I, I'm asking the opponents this, and, and then maybe um, the sponsor could weigh in. So there was no, uh, you were not asked to, about this bill until last minute? You were not asked to come to the table at all? Uh, that's correct, um, uh, Delegate Boyce. Uh, we have met one other time in the past, uh, probably a year and a half, at Maryland Motor Truck for two of their uh, trucking companies who several of our members were members of Maryland Motor Truck also to weigh in on two out-of-state bills that the trucking companies thought were extremely high. As far as dealing with this directly is uh, this issue going on, we have never been asked to come to sit down there or at a remote location and bring all the parties, which we feel including the Maryland State Police and any delegates or people that are interested to sit down to try to work this out so that it's fair to everyone and especially to consumers. Okay, thank you. Um, thank my next you, ma'am. You're welcome. The next question is, there's a lot of talk about tow and recovery. Can someone give me a very uh, brief but thorough difference between tow and recovery? Because some of you have been, you say, call yourself a tow company. Some of you call yourself tow and recovery. There's clearly a difference. Could you let us know what that difference is? Delegate Boyce, I'll take this one. Um, towing is when you move the vehicle. Recovery is when you clean everything up. So if the car turns over, riding the vehicle is going to be recovery. Bringing it from point A to point B is a tow. Got it. Okay. And then my last question is about this price per pound. And so is it fair to say, and I believe uh, it was either Mr. Hurley or Miss. Oh, she was our last speaker, but you mentioned that um, in an accident and especially given the cargo and given the type of, of vehicle um, that there could be multiple insurances, there me that means there's multiple claims. And is it fair to say potentially that this is what leads to the high cost? And one, two, is that per pound um, rate given to each um, insurance company associated with an accident? So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, we so hear you. On, on the price, per, <clears throat> if somebody uses price per pound, um, the insurance companies will break the bills down amongst themselves to split the bill, um, depending on what their what they think that their individual pieces owned of what they insured. Just wanted to add one thing to a question from earlier, if, if that answered your, your question. Um, they were asking about holding cargo hostage. As far as I'm concerned, whoever's paying them to haul that cargo should make sure that they have the proper insurance to take the cargo. Because I know if I give someone a load of my valuables to transport, I'm gonna make sure that they're covered um, in case there is an accident. And that's, uh, that's the, I think the main problem here is that a lot of these insurance agents are selling the cheapest policies that they can. So these truckers are underinsured and that's where the problems come into play. Okay, that was actually my next question about adequate insurance and whether or not um, um, we have looked at the different rates and what it really costs to one, um, 
and I think to someone's point was, you know, safety is your first um, uh, priority, but safety as it relates to protecting the, 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 the truck, the individual driving the truck, the truck or the towing equipment, but most importantly, the cargo. It's kind of like when I go to the, to the mailbox and deliver a, a package at the, at the mail office, they ask if I want insurance because if something happens, it protects the inside. So I guess that's my next question and we can discuss it further in a potential subcommittee, but, um, but it sounds like what you're saying is that uh, inadequate insurance is also potentially leading to some of these issues as it relates to- Yes, and there's also, so the, um, whenever you're talking about the, uh, the, the damage to the cargo and stuff like that, that's another reason why our equipment has gotten so expensive because they're making the, the equipment they're hauling this stuff in cheaper and cheaper as they are, you know, most everything. Um, you know, the, the trailers used to have steel in them and be strong and now they're, they're fiberglass, they're very flimsy. So it, it takes a lot of uh, extra care to, to get these things uprighted and transported without uh, just needing a, a wheel loader and some dumpsters. Right. So the industry hasn't, hasn't kept up, insurance hasn't kept up with the industry is what you're saying. Thank you. I'm yeah. done, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, Delegate Laban. Mary? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, so I have a, a relatively, I think, quick and straightforward question about the role of police because two of the witnesses have commented about the, the you know, lack of input and involvement by state police. My understanding is that the role of police is really strictly limited when it involves the towing industry to making sure the roadway is clear and the site is, is secured um, and, and or cleaned up. Um, they cannot get involved, it, it, I, I don't believe, any further. And, and it, the law is pretty clear that way because we wanna keep police and, and towing companies apart because of a long history around those relationships. I'll just leave it at that. So Ms. Zekwick, I, uh, Zek Tick, I'm sorry, I think comment on, I, I'm, I'm amazed police aren't here. And then I think uh, somebody else, uh, Mr. Hurley made the same comment. I, I'm, I don't know if any of our committee counsel or anyone on here is equipped to answer that, but I don't believe they're allowed to be any further involved in these kinds of conversations. That's my yeah, understanding. I, I mean, I think that's probably true. And I think that when there's a dispute between two industry groups, generally speaking, the police don't want to weigh in because they want, don't want to appear to be biased for one or against another industry group. But uh, um, yeah, I, I agree Harvard, with that. You, I think, yeah, but I think yeah. it is particularly sensitive when, it, when you're talking about towing. At least that's my understanding. Thank mm -hmm. you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Barbara. Yeah, sure. So, so we're talking about disasters that happen in streets, right? So this is a government function to keep those streets clear. So there has to be a government entity that's responsible for clearing that roadway, right? So usually, and certainly in this case, it's the Maryland State Police. Now, I don't know if they have a contractual relationship, but that's usually how this would be done. And that's certainly how it's done in the city of Baltimore. The towers are contractors to the police to help them clear the roads. And that's why I made the comparison to the fire department and that sort of thing, because this is a public service that the state is providing keeping the roads clear. Um, we're not talking about something where we're trying to adjudicate between two private entities. We're not talking about clearing roads on private property. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about clearing public, public right away to keep it safe, which is why this is a fundamentally police issue. Okay, next question goes to Delegate Healy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like, I haven't heard, maybe I, I missed it, but I haven't heard anyone address the issue of the toll facilities already have these regulations and have this process. And this bill seems to be trying to move that across all the highways in the state through the state police and using a similar, if not identical format. And um, this complaints about all of these things, nobody's really addressed how it's working on the toll facilities. And there are a lot of them in Maryland. There's highways, tunnels, bridges, all kinds of things. Uh, can somebody please, one of the opponents of this bill, explain why it works fine on the toll facilities and there's a problem with doing the same thing everywhere else? 
Maybe I can answer that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Uh, I've worked for the toll facilities now for over 25 years. And with that being said, it's a Comar rule. You have to submit your rates, price per pound or um, hourly, whatever it may be. For an example, if you're going to do uh, light duty towing, it's one uh, rate. If you do heavy duty, it's another rate. It's a Comar way of following it. Uh, they have restrictions. They have guidelines on what equipment you must have. Not that you're able to be, be able to use. You must own a lot of equipment. You have to have a rotator. You have to have air cushions. You have to have articulate loaders. You have to have uh, a heavier insurance than the state requires. You have to have um, equipment people that are trained. You have to have a crash trailer. It's a lot of equipment that demands you to be on the Comar list. With that being said, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the track trailer turned over inside the tunnel. We're a company that did that. We had to require the use of four rotators in that tunnel in order to not do any damage to the tunnel. The insurance companies understood it, paid it with no problem. There was no issues. But the thing is, you have to have certain equipment where the state police does not have you have any certain equipment at this point in time. They recommend it. They inspect it. But there's no requirements. That's why the toll facility does work very well. So let me follow up on Delegate Healy's question, uh, uh, Wayne. So I guess the argument you're making is that the additional cost and equipment requirements in a toll facility would be a burdensome requirement to impose for the entire road network. Is that what you're saying? No, but you're going to ask for a lot of expenses. And this, my problem with that is, is that when you try to regulate this and the way you're trying to do it, I mean, we sit down and, and have the right conversation, get it done like Comar did. You're going to ex extend a lot of expenses on all the towing companies. Some of the towing companies may not be able to do it. You're going to have problems with clearing the roadways. And right now you've got the I-95 Calder, uh, the, the, the uh, chart program, the, the VDOT program, all of them forcing you to clear the road in so many minutes. There was a thing called a trip program that was going to come to Maryland. Unfortunately, it didn't make it. Gave you 90 minutes to clear that road, period. And they actually, when we, we went to Maryland, Department of Transportation and discussed this, the head man of the Maryland Department of Transportation said, you will bring the equipment we're going to demand you to bring and told Maryland Motor Truck, he didn't care what it cost to get their stuff off the road. He's going to clear that road in a timely fashion. I'm only telling you what Maryland Motor uh, MDOT said. So yes, it would be. There was a, a program that was being put out there, but the problem was, I think the state fell short of a budget of the incentive. I don't know. Okay. Uh, before I recognize, um, oh, um, I guess Delegate Love put her hand down. Um, okay, we're, uh, unless there are any other questions here, I think we're going to let this be, uh, take this into the subcommittee and have them sort it out. So um, good public hearing. Uh, uh, that concludes public hearing on this bill. So um, announcements by subcommittee chairs. Announcements? Yes, I have one. Uh, Ann, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand, but... Um, Fine. Uh, yes, the uh, local government subcommittee will meet in um, at, at 3.05. From, we're going to discuss one bill. Okay. Any other subcommittee chairs? Yes. Uh, yeah. H who, who, go David. ahead. David. Uh, you should all have, for motor vehicle, you should have received a email. We are not going to meet today. We'll meet next week. So you're off the hook for today. Okay. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Well, just to remind you all, we're going to have our first voting session uh, tomorrow at 11. And, uh, you know, we'll refresh ourselves on what the rules are and everything, uh, or I'll ref uh, refresh the you all with the rules uh, that we proceed under. And so I don't see any more um, hands up. So I'm going to assume nobody has anything intelligent to say at this point. So uh, up oh, there's Mary. <laughs> Go ahead, Mary. I, I don't know that it's intelligence, but um, uh, this inquiring mind wants to know whether I miss the uh, list of bills we're voting on tomorrow. Is that coming later today? Uh, that, that was emailed last night, I think. Okay. Check your email. 
It, All right, I missed it. Was it was emailed this morning. Or this morning, okay. This morning. Okay, thank you. I'll look for it. Thank you. Okay. And uh, okay, if that's all, uh, you are all free on your own recognizance. Um, <laughs> Gang. This afternoon. Take care, everybody. See you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Bye.